The Lewis Miller Memorial Fund of the Chautauqua Foundation provides funding for today's lecture with Dr. Natalie Battaglia. Established in 1932 by Mr. Miller's daughter, Mina Miller Edison, it memorializes the Chautauqua co-founder and honors a man dedicated to increasing Chautauquans' exposure to education, science, and music. The extended Miller family continues active participation here at Chautauqua, so please join me in thanking them for their leadership and support. And we also honor Lewis Miller's legacy. You may have seen NASA astrophysicist Dr. Natalie Battaglia wearing a t-shirt yesterday proclaiming, in my day, we had nine planets. <laughs> a researcher at NASA Ames Research Center and mission scientist for NASA's Kepler mission, she is driven and inspired by the question of whether we as a planet are not alone. After earning a bachelor's degree in physics from Berkeley and a doctorate in astrophysics from the University of Santa Cruz, she joined NASA's Ames Research Center in the early stages of the Kepler mission in 2000, working with a team to identify exoplanets. The Kepler mission's aim is to survey our region of the Milky Way for planets orbiting other sun-like stars to discover if there are habitable planets in our galaxy. Her leadership led to the 2011 discovery of Kepler 10b, which was the first confirmed rocky planet outside our solar system. A self-proclaimed planet hunter, Dr. Battaglia's work has pushed us into scientific exploration of new realms of existence and life. She and daughter Sophia, right now at the Boys and Girls Club, where she made 27 new friends yesterday, are with us for most of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, scientists, star and planet gazers, and funny t-shirt enthusiasts, please help me welcome Dr. Natalie Mattalia to Chautauqua. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Uh, thank you to the institution for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here and to all of you beautiful people for coming and sharing this time with me. I appreciate that. Uh, if you were here yesterday, you probably heard Brian Green talk about multiverses, other potential universes out there. And as I, as I sat on the porch yesterday, watching my daughter bike down to the lake with her new 27 friends, um, listening to, to music from a distance. There was a woman on the grass playing the recorder. If you're here in the audience, thank you so much. Um, as I experienced that, I thought to myself, this really is a unique universe right here, um, a place that is inspiring and peaceful, a place where all the best of, of humans flourishes. So I'm, I feel very honored to be here and to, to witness that, so thank you for that. A Planet for Goldilocks is the title of my talk. Humanity is on a quest to find life in the universe. And no, this is not a uh, science fiction talk. Nor am I being fanciful. For the first time, we can have a dialogue about the possibility of answering a question humans have asked themselves forever. Are we alone in the, in the galaxy or in the universe? We can have that dialogue because we basically have a road map to answer that question. We are at a turning point where we will have that answer soon, maybe not within my lifetime, but maybe in a couple generations. And that's exciting, that's thrilling. To, to really be able to contemplate that and have that dialogue. So that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, there are kind of three approaches to finding life beyond Earth. You can explore the solar system. We have rovers on Mars. We know it once had liquid water. Maybe once upon a time, there was simple life forms there. 
Uh, maybe one day we will send humans to excavate and, and find fossils, evidence maybe of, of blue-green algae, one of the first life forms that existed on Earth. Uh, maybe one day we will send robots, maybe one day we will send humans out to the outer satellites of the, of the outer planets, uh, places like Enceladus and Europa that have subsurface oceans that might harbor life. Another option for finding life is to listen to the universe, like SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence does, the SETI Institute does this, to listen for radio signals, signals that might not have a naturally occurring source, right? Maybe evidence that there is some technologically savvy civilization out there. That's the second way. But the third way is the one that I'm here to talk about today. The third way is to find the potential cradles of life. Planets orbiting other stars, planets that we might recognize as home, planets that have the same properties as Earth. This one lone outpost that we know of where life exists. Once we establish whether or not those worlds exist in the galaxy, then we can build instruments to detect signs of life, biosignatures, oxygen in the atmosphere, which is a result of, of, of life on, on the surface of the planet, to determine if it's a living world. These planets orbiting stars, we call them exoplanets because they are outside the solar system. Exoplanets. And in my talk, I will, I will speak about exoplanets and I will speak about planets. I'll use those two terms interchangeably. But every time I say planet, you know I'm talking about planets orbiting other stars, not planets in our own solar system. Okay? All right. We are going to begin with a fairy tale. Once upon a time in a deep, dark forest, a little girl named Goldilocks wandered into the forest alone, far from home. And in the middle of the forest, she came upon an enchanted, warm and inviting little house. And the door was open, so she invited herself in. On the table were three pots of porridge. The first was scalding hot, the second was too cold, but the third was just right. And she was famished from her wandering and decided to take a taste and ended up eating the whole entire thing. She was so tired from her wandering, she wanted to sit down and she found three chairs. The first was too hard, the second too soft, but the third was just right. And she rocked and rocked and rocked until that chair crumbled to pieces onto the floor. Still tired from her great wandering, she went to the bedroom and found three beds. The first was too hard, the second was too soft, but the third was just right. And she fell into a deep, deep slumber. The story of Goldilocks is familiar to all of us. We know the ending of the story. Uh, Goldilocks ran home that day <laughs> in terror. And maybe in her terror, she learned some lessons about trespassing and maybe about uh, the ills of an inflated sense of self-entitlement. Uh, <laughs> but as a child, I'd like to think that Goldilocks also was able to maintain her sense of, of curiosity and her adventurous spirit, the very qualities that made her wander into the forest, into the unknown to begin with. And those are the qualities that I'd like to circle back on in my talk. And who knows what Goldilocks might have become if she retained those qualities. Perhaps she set her sights higher as she learned these important lessons in life. There is a Goldilocks in all of us. And the cosmic forest beckons because we are innately explorers. And this is a theme I'd like to, you to be thinking about as we learn about the exoplanets that the Kepler mission has discovered. Kepler is a NASA mission, and it was funded to answer one very simple question. What fraction of stars in our galaxy harbor potentially habitable Earth-sized planets? Simply put, what is the prevalence of Earth-sized planets in our galaxy? Does nature make them efficiently? Are they ubiquitous? Are they everywhere? Or are we some cosmic fluke? 
That's the question that we're trying to answer. Um, but before we get too far into it, let's think about how difficult it is to find planets. This is a little cartoon that shows the relative sizes of our sun and the planets in the solar system. They're very small. Planets are the afterthought of star formation. They're the debris, they're the leftovers, they're the nothing. My mom would sweep them right out of the house, right? Uh, if the sun were the size of a basketball, Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, would be about the size of one of those super balls, one of those really bouncy balls. And our little tiny planet Earth, you probably can't even see on the slide, it's on the far, uh, the third rock from the sun, so the third rock from the left, it'd be about a half of the size of a grain of sand. And the Earth in this thought experiment would be about 84 feet across, maybe the other side of this, of this amphitheater. Jupiter would be out beyond the entrance to Chautauqua. The nearest star is going to be almost on the coast of Europe. Space is very empty, and the planets are very small. If you took all the mass in the solar system, except for the sun, all of this debris, it would add up to less than 1% the mass of the sun. Jupiter is 10 times smaller in diameter, and Earth is another 10 times smaller still. And if you consider the amount of light that's emanating from these objects, if you want to actually point a telescope out into the universe and take a picture of a planet, the amount of light that's being emitted or reflected off of the surface of that planet is about 10 billion times smaller than the light from the star itself. So these planets are literally lost within the glare of their parent stars. Taking pictures of these planets is going to be extremely technically challenging, but not impossible. Okay? But for the time being, we're not going to be talking about direct images of planets. We're going to be talking about discoveries that have been made inferring the existence of a planet by observing something about the star itself. Okay? Now, before Kepler even launched, we knew of planets orbiting other stars, hundreds of them, actually. In fact, this is a cartoon from one of my favorite cartoon sites called xkcd.com. I love it. Um, and in this cartoon is just a bunch of circles, a bunch of, of colored circles. Every one of those is supposed to represent a planet discovery as of, I think, June of 2012 when this cartoon was published, okay? Now, in the very center of that circle, it's very difficult to see, but there is a tiny group of planets that are encompassed by a light gray rectangle. Those are the solar system planets. And the two biggest ones that you see there are Jupiter and Saturn. So if you scan your eye over this whole entire cartoon, you notice that the majority of the planets that were discovered to date are larger than Jupiter, not including Kepler's discoveries. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about how these non-Kepler discoveries were made. Yesterday, you heard about gravity from the master himself, right? So you are experts on gravity. Orbital motion. Planets are kept orbiting their stars, just like twirling a rock over your head, the string keeping the rock from flying out in a straight line. For planets and stars, the string is the force of gravity that keeps the planet always pulled inward, keeps it from flying off into a straight line. And what you might not appreciate about that story is that, yes, planets are orbiting stars in this way, but it's also true that the star is orbiting the planet. But we don't think about that. It's analogous if you are, have ever been ice skating and you, as a kid you play that game where you go out on the ice and you, you grab hands with a, with a friend and you start spinning around in circles, right? You're both moving right? You're both moving in circles. Now, if you replace your friend with a child or with an adult, it's going to change the dynamics completely, right? If you are spinning with an adult, you're going to go flying around in circles. The adult is barely going to move because the adult has more inertia. And the same is true with the planet-star systems. In this cartoon that you're watching, 
the star and the planet are both orbiting about their common center of mass. If you imagined a, a rod connecting the star and the planet, and you had to find the fulcrum point where those two would be balanced, that's the center of mass. That's the point about which they orbit. And that center of mass is going to be very close to the star, right? So the star is barely going to move. In fact, we call it, we call it a wobble. Because it is, it's just a barely a wobble, right? The planet is the one doing all of the accelerating. And so what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can detect that wobble of the star. And that wobble is going to be an indication that something is tugging on the star. It's going to be an indication of mass, an indication of the existence of a planet. So we're going to do this by collecting light with our most powerful telescopes. And here you see an image of the twin Keck 10-meter telescopes atop Mauna Kea in Hawaii. These are two of humanity's largest eyeballs to the universe, collecting light. And so we use these giant light buckets to collect photons from distant stars, and we take that light and we put it through an instrument that splits the light up into a rainbow of color, just like a crystal hanging in your window, right? Here I have a picture of what that spectrum might look like. And I've made a spectrum so broad, a rainbow so wide, that I actually had to fold it up like an accordion. But here you see all the colors from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, down at the bottom. And if you look carefully, what you notice is that there, there are some colors missing. The atmosphere of the star literally eats away some of the photons, but only the tasty ones, only the ones that it likes. It doesn't eat all of the photons equally. And so you get places where there are colors missing. These are called absorption lines. And they give us a great deal of information about a star. We can tell what a star's temperature is on the surface. We can tell what a star is made out of. And we can tell if a star is in motion through the Doppler effect. So here's the idea. We're going to zoom in on one of these absorption lines, one of these black absences of photons. And if you look carefully and you take measurements with time, you notice that the absence of color is moving back and forth. It's sloshing around. And it's doing so because the star itself is moving. This is the Doppler effect. It's the same effect that makes a train whistle have a high pitch as it's coming towards you and a low pitch as it's moving away from you. It's the same Doppler method that the, that the highway patrol uses to catch you speeding. Nobody here speeds, I know. But, but that's the same method. So by measuring how much it's sloshing back and forth, we know the strength of the force that's tugging on that star and therefore the mass of the planet. Okay? That's the Doppler method. But the Doppler method up until now is capable of detecting speeds, wobbles of about like a walking speed, maybe a meter per second, a yard per second. That's a comfortable walking speed. But a planet like Earth, orbiting a star like our sun at its position, is not going to have a comfortable walking speed motion. It's not going to induce a, a meter per second wobble of the star. It's going to induce maybe an ant crawling speed, some centimeters per second. And at this moment in time, we do not have the technology to detect such a tiny motion, such a weak gravitational tug. If we want to find a true Earth analog, if we want to find Earth 2.0, we're going to have to use a different technique. And that's where the Kepler mission comes in. Three, two, engine start, one, zero, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. This is the launch of the Kepler satellite. It launched in March of 2009. I was there with all of my colleagues. It was a joyful moment. Uh, Kepler is NASA's first mission capable of detecting an Earth-sized planet in orbit about a sun-like star. 
It's a space-based telescope orbiting the sun, not the Earth. So it has a continuous view, unblocked view, of a section of the galaxy near the galactic plane in the summer triangle marked by the bright stars Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Nestled under the wing of the swan Cygnus is a patch of sky about the size of my hand where Kepler is monitoring stars and searching for planets. You saw a mosaic of squares, and here you see why. This is the mosaic of detectors which catch the light from the stars that we are imaging. They're detectors very much like what you have in your cell phone to take a picture, but it's one square foot of silicon. This is what the image looks like. Every tiny point you see, all of that salt sprinkled, every single one is a star. In this one handprint on the sky, there are four and a half million stars in our galaxy alone. We cherry-picked about 150,000 of the brightest of those stars to monitor for exoplanets. Okay? But this gives you an idea of the magnitude of stars in our galaxy. Four and a half million stars just in a handprint, admittedly close to the galactic plane. But four and a half million is a small fraction of the hundreds of billions of stars that are in our one galaxy alone. How are we going to take these images, this, this information, and discover planets? How are we going to infer the existence of planets? Well, we're going to make use of the fact that every object suspended in a beam of light, a star beam of light, a stellar beam of light, is casting a shadow out into the galaxy. At this very moment in time, our own Earth is casting a shadow out into the galaxy, out into space. We don't become aware of it until we maybe see our own shadow projected against the, the face of the moon during a, solar, uh, during a lunar eclipse, right? Um, but nevertheless, it's there, always being cast out into, the, into space. Here is a picture taken by the International Space Station of a very nice shadow being cast onto the surface of our own planet. That's the shadow of our own moon. Our own moon is also always casting a shadow out into space. And here, during this solar eclipse, it just happened to be caught by the surface of our planet, enabling us to see it. So what Kepler is going to do is really quite simple. In staring at this one patch of sky in the galaxy, Kepler is going to measure the brightnesses of stars and hope that some of these stars, all randomly oriented in space, are going to have planetary systems whose orbits are aligned so that the planet passes directly between the telescope and the disk of the star. And what that means is that the shadow of that planet is going to sweep across the face of our telescope. Here is an image of, from Kepler, you saw something similar a second ago. In the middle, it's blown up, and on the right-hand side, it's blown up even more. And you start to see the pixelated nature of those images. We collect those pixels and we add up the number of photons that, were, that fell on those pixels, and that it gets turned into a brightness. So what we actually measure is, is cartooned in that green line. The green line shows the brightness of the star with time, with the passage of time. And if a planet swings into view and blocks some of the disk of that star, the brightness is going to momentarily diminish, right? And the amount of diminishing of light is going to tell us how big the planet was. A big occulting disk will block out a lot of light, a small one less, right? And the time between dimmings of light tells us the orbital period of the planet, how long it takes to orbit once. Very, very simple. What makes this such an incredible experiment is the stability that's required. As I said, the amount of dimming depends on the size of the exoplanet. Here's a cartoon showing a star like our sun and the size of a Jupiter-sized planet. A Jupiter is going to remove about 1% of the light. That's easy. In fact, we could do that with ground-based telescopes. Don't need to go to space. But this is what an Earth looks like. 
earth is going to remove one part per 10,000. The analogy I'd like to use is to imagine the tallest building in New York City, the tallest hotel, let's say. It's, you know, it's many tens of stories high. And in this hotel, in our thought experiment, every single room is occupied, and it's nighttime. And every single occupant of that hotel has the light of their room turned on. So every window is illuminated. And then one person in this tallest hotel in downtown New York City, one person in that hotel goes to the window and lowers the blinds by about two centimeters. <laughs> That's one part per 10,000. That's what we're trying to detect. But if we see these dimmings of light, if they're periodic, if they're repetitive, they happen the same exact way every time, we know we can infer the existence of a planet, and we can measure its size, and we can measure its orbital period. Okay? Okay, now, let's go back to Goldilocks. Now Goldilocks has a dilemma, because she's not quite sure what the just right planet is going to be, right? What kind of a planet requires life? Or, or what, what kind of requirements are there for life on a planet? Uh, it could be very complex, right? I mean, let's think about it. What do we need for existence? We need um, a lake. Uh, we need oxygen. Uh, I need pizza. I don't know about you. I, I need pizza. <laughs> um, but, you know, there might be other things, too. You might need plate tectonics to cycle carbon dioxide and have that, that thermostat that regulates the temperature of the atmosphere. Uh, you might need a large satellite to regulate the spin axis of your planet and shield you from incoming collisions. And the list can, goes on and on. We can make a list very, very long. And every time we do so, we become more and more restrictive. But let's boil it down to its essence. What is the one fundamental thing that all life requires? Can we choose one common thing? Yeah, you know the answer already. Oxygen. Ah, maybe we don't. So we, we approach this problem in the following way. We say, okay, let's take a census of all creatures on Earth, um, not just intelligent creatures, but plant life, etc. And let's find out what they need for existence. And we go to far extremes. We go to the hottest places. We go to the driest places. We go to the coldest places. We go into the hot springs at Yellowstone where you have a high um, acid content. Or we go to places where there's a high salinity. We go to all the extremes of planet Earth. And we find an enormous diversity of creatures. Life on Earth is robust and prolific. It seems to inhabit every nook and cranny. But as diverse as all these, uh, these organisms are, they have one thing in common. They are carbon-based, correct. And carbon-based chemistry, organic chemistry as we understand it, requires as a solvent to facilitate all those important chemical reactions like metabolism, liquid water. So we are going to go in pursuit of liquid water. That is, planets where liquid water could pool on the, surface, on the surface. And therein arises a new vocabulary word, which many of you probably have already heard. How many of you have heard the term habitable zone? OK, many, many of you have not. That's fantastic. The habitable zone is the Goldilocks zone. It's that, that region in that planetary system where the temperatures aren't so hot that water would all boil off the surface and not so cold that water would all be locked up into ice form, but just right, where, the, where you get just the right amount of energy for liquid water to potentially pool on the surface of that planet. That's the Goldilocks zone. And in this cartoon, it's represented by the green shaded region. Now, stars come in different sizes and temperatures and the like. Not all stars are the same. Some stars are blazing hot and luminous. Other stars are little embers burning. So where that habitable zone is is going to depend on this, how, how brightly the campfire in the middle is shining, right, is burning. If it's a weak campfire, you have to cozy up next to it to get the same amount of energy. 
Well, we measure the orbital period with Kepler, right? That, that time between dimmings of light. And there was a fellow by the name of Johannes Kepler about 400 years ago who discovered empirically that there's a direct relationship between the orbital period and the separation between the star and the planet. So if we measure the orbital period, we get the distance between the star and the planet. And if we know how, what kind of a star it is, what kind of a campfire it is, we can ascertain if this world could be potentially habitable in that liquid water could potentially pool on the surface. So that's the objective. Um, what I'd like to do is give you a bird's eye view of what Kepler has discovered so far. I mentioned to you that it launched in 2009, so it flew for four years. We've collected four years of data. It recently stopped taking data uh, on May 14th, my birthday actually. Uh, we had <laughs> an unforeseen event and stopped taking data. Um, but the mission was actually planned and built to survive through November of 2012. So it had completed its baseline mission. Of the four years of data that we have collected, we have combed through about half of it. And those are the results I'm going to show you today. Okay? And I'm going to do so by showing one technical diagram, so bear with me. It's a scatter plot. On the y-axis is the size of the planet, like diameter or radius, and it's measured relative to Earth, so a value of one would be exactly Earth-sized. Okay? And I even put in horizontal lines to mark those sizes for you. So the bottom horizontal line corresponds to an Earth size. The next one up corresponds to Neptune. The next one up corresponds to Jupiter. On the x-axis is the orbital period measured in days. And it's a funny logarithmic scale, but don't worry about that. It stretches from very, very short, some hours, out to about 5,000 days. And in this scatter plot, we have one lonely point, one lonely pink point. And in the bottom right-hand corner, it says 1995. That was the year in Florence, Italy, at a conference called Cool Stars, Stellar Systems, and the Sun. Notice the word planet isn't anywhere in that title. Michel Mayor announced the discovery of the first exoplanet orbiting a normal sun-like star. And that's where it resided in this scatter plot. It was a Jupiter-sized planet at a very short orbital period, like three days. And it was a huge surprise. How in the world can a gas giant exist in a three-day orbit around a star? It was tremendously puzzling and a good lesson for us. So, on the top, I've color-coded this. The pink points are planets that are discovered by this wobble method. And that was the case of this first planet, 51 Pegasus b. It was discovered by the Doppler wobble method that I talked about at first. The blue points are planets that were discovered by the transit method, this eclipse method that Kepler uses. We call it the transit method because the planet is transiting across the disk of the star. And if the transiting planets were discovered by Kepler, it's going to be colored yellow. So I'm going to tick forward now the years and show you how over the last, what, 20 years or so, we have accumulated discoveries, starting out with this first one. So I run it forward. You see here 99, 2001, 2003, 2005, 2007, and I'm going to pause in 2009. The very first blue point appeared around 2001. That was the first transiting planet. HD 209458 was its very poetic name. But you notice some patterns here, right? You've got a swarm of points at Jupiter sizes and short orbital periods. You've got another swarm of points above Jupiter sizes and long orbital periods. Well, let's fill in the rest of the points between 2009 and 2012 without the Kepler discoveries. And you'll see that the Doppler method became more powerful 
more points are filling in towards smaller and smaller planets, so we have a little salt and peppering of small things that are being discovered, at least at short orbital periods. And in the subsequent slide, I'm going to show you how Kepler has contributed to this pool. After analyzing two years of data, the planet count has gone from about 700 to about 3,700. Every yellow point that you see there is a Kepler discovery. And what's remarkable about this diagram is that whereas before Kepler, 85% of the discoveries were planets larger than Neptune, after Kepler, 85% of the discoveries are smaller than Neptune which tells us that the ground-based discoveries that we knew of were heavily biased by our technology, what was feasible, what was possible with the Doppler method, right? Kepler has opened up new possibilities. With a new piece of technology, you open up windows to discoveries that weren't possible before. And this is the beauty of, of the science that we're doing. Let me express this as a bar diagram, just showing the different sizes. Uh, what you see here is that something like 350 are Earth-sized. Uh, the largest, the tallest bar is around Neptune size, which is between what we've said, two to six Earth radii. Two to six times the size of the Earth. Neptune is about four times the size of the Earth. So that's the tallest bar in our discoveries. Um, but Jupiter's and larger, those are very very rare. Of course, with two years of data, we're only sensitive to things that have short orbital periods. Perhaps by analyzing the next two years of data, we will start to see the gas giants rise in numbers. But for now, at these short orbital periods, the Earths, the Neptunes, and another category that I have, haven't yet mentioned, the super-Earths, <laughs> um, these are also very common. It's interesting, the super-Earths are very interesting to me because we don't have these kinds of planets in our solar system. We've got Earth, the largest of the terrestrial-sized planets, and the next biggest planet is Neptune, about four times the size of Earth. We've got nothing in between, and yet we find these planets that are between about 1.25 and 2 Earth radii, or even 2.5 radii, are very numerous in the galaxy. So it'll be interesting to learn what are these. Are these really super-Earths, which, which kind of invokes an image of something rocky but scaled up, lots of real estate, right? <laughs> or is it, are they something more like a mini-Neptune, which invokes a completely different image, right? Something that maybe has a uh, gas and ice envelope, something that doesn't have a solid surface necessarily. We don't know. We're going to discover this as we characterize these new worlds, these thousands of new worlds that Kepler has, has discovered. Okay, I'd like to just now tell you a little bit about some of the specific worlds that we have found, because we found so many exotic, interesting things, and give you a sense of our progress towards finding a planet for Goldilocks. Um, let's go back to our pixelated little image Unfortunately, Kepler is not like the Hubble Space Telescope. We don't take these like beautiful pictures that make the front page of the New York Times, right? Um, you just get this kind of grayscale, black and white, pixelated little postage stamp. But to me, it almost seems like magic how we turn that black and white, boring little postage stamp, pixelated postage stamp, into a new world, right? I wanted to show you at least one example of what the data actually looks like. After you sum up the intensities of each of those little pixels and you get a brightness, one brightness measurement is taken simultaneously for 150,000 stars once every 30 minutes and did that for four years straight without blinking, right? As much as possible. You blink, you miss them because a transit is only going to last some hours. That dimming of light is only going to last some hours. You blink, you miss it, 
right? And, it's, and for the most interesting ones, it's only going to come around again in another year, right? So you don't want to blink. So in the middle panel, I have a series of these brightness measurements. Every tiny little white point that you see is one brightness measurement for this particular star. Um, the star is Kepler-10b. And you see there's a lot, of, a lot of noise, right, up and down, kind of a big cloud of points, and that represents the measurement error. But you also see very clearly that systematic diminishing of light, that tiny one part, one and a half parts per 10,000, indicative of a planet only 40% only larger than the Earth, which was Kepler-10b. But the reason I'm showing you this, all, I mean, to show you the data, but also to then tell you the next step, what we do to help us, myself included, understand this as really a new world, to really imagine what this place might be like. We give all of the information that we know from our data to an artist, and we let them render these worlds. And so some of this is flight of fancy, some of it is imagination, but it's always amazing to me how much we actually do know about some of these worlds that we have spent time characterizing very carefully after the discovery epoch. And so much of what you see is based on some knowledge, fundamental knowledge about the, about the planet. And so on the right-hand side, you see one of these artist's renderings. And I'm showing you this and making this point because these are not actual pictures of planets. We do not, remember, go up and point a telescope and take a picture of a planet. This is an artist's rendering. So one of the um, interesting things that we're finding are planetary systems where you've got a star and you've got multiple dimmings of light all kind of going on and off and blinking with multiple planets going around and casting their shadow across the face of our telescope. And in some cases, these planets are packed pretty tightly together. They're not nicely spread out like they are in our solar system. And when they're packed so tightly, odd things happen you see by staring at this animation that the planetary orbits are not perfectly uniform in their velocity. They kind of go in starts and fits. And the circle, that little white circle, doesn't perfectly close back on itself. Each time, the orbit is slightly different. And this is because the planets themselves are so packed that they're feeling the gravitational force of one due to the other, not just the dominant gravitational force of the parent star. And that's been phenomenal because through those little tiny interactions, we were able to measure the gravitational force between the planets and therefore their individual masses. That's been a surprise. Um, another really interesting surprise was that Kepler finally, after all these years, some decades, finally proved that George Lucas was right. <laughs> he nailed it when he created Tatooine, the home world of Luke Skywalker, with two stars, not one, rising above the horizon and setting on the other horizon. Um, there are, we have learned from Kepler that there are planets in orbit about gravitationally bound star systems. So you would see two suns rising, those two stars are orbiting one another, so they would swap places with each other as they move across the sky. We have found planets that are just the right size. Kepler-20, little e, little f, those are the planets, are, are shown here in relation to Earth and Venus. And you can see that one is just slightly bigger, one is just slightly smaller, but they are both too, too hot, orbiting in just like 10, 12, 15 days. Um, around their parent star, which means they're very close, which means these are blow-torched worlds. That's why the one on the left is colored this glowing orange. It probably has an ocean, maybe the size of the Pacific Ocean, but it's not an ocean of water, it's an ocean of lava, because it's so hot. We've also found worlds that are just the right temperature. In fact, Kepler-22b, here depicted, is in an orbit very much like our own Earth, has an orbital period of about 290 days compared to 365, right? It's in that Goldilocks zone, but it's too big, we think. It's 
2.4 times the size of the Earth. We think this is more like a mini Neptune instead of a super Earth, right? But what happens if you take a planet like Neptune and you yank it from the outskirts of the solar system and you plunk it down at, at, at the Earth's distance, where it's bombarded by more energy from the star? We don't know. Who knows? Maybe this mini Neptune has a subsurface ocean of liquid water. Maybe the Loch Ness Monster is swimming there. And finally, Kepler's smallest habitable zone exoplanets that have been discovered so far were just announced in April of this year. This is the Kepler-62 system, Kepler-62 E and F, which, by the way, implies that there's also a BCD in the system. So this is a five-planet system. Um, planets E and F are in the Goldilocks zone. Moreover, Kepler-62f is just 40% larger than the Earth. And we now know of a handful, less than five, planets like Kepler-10b, which are about that size, 40% larger than the Earth, and are rocky. These are terrestrial worlds. These are worlds you could stand on. And this one, Kepler-62f, is in the habitable zone. So this is our best example so far of a planet for Goldilocks. So she's, she's celebrating there, eating her porridge. This is the system compared to our solar system. Um, so you remember those schematics of the orbits in that green shaded region, which is the habitable zone? On the bottom, you see our own solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and the green shaded region, our own habitable zone that stretches from just about Venus, a little bit outward of Venus, out to just beyond Mars is our habitable zone. The system of Kepler-62 is shrunk. Why? Because its central star is a weak campfire. The habitable zone is cozied in, right? So that means that the orbital period of its, of its habitable planets are substantially quicker. Little 62 E and F have substantially quicker orbital periods than our own Earth. All right. Let's go back to this bar diagram that I showed you. And, and remember, I told you that the, the objective of Kepler is to come up with this one number. What is the fraction of stars in the galaxy that harbor potentially habitable Earth-sized planets? Right? We need a number, it is, you know, like 10 percent, 50 percent, 200 percent. That number is going to drive future missions. So we need to nail it. Okay, so I said we've got about 3,000 planets here. Um, if you do the math, it probably doesn't add up to 3,000 because we just dumped another 500 into the archive, you know, so it went up from like 2,700 to 3,200 about a week ago. Um, we observed 150,000 stars. Okay, so can you take 351 Earth-sized planets and it took 150,000 stars to find them? Does that mean that the prevalence of Earth-sized planets is really, really tiny? No. Why? Because the orbital inclination had to be aligned just right for you to see that transit event. And the probability of that alignment is really tiny. It's like a half of 1%, which means for every one you found, there's 200 others out there in that handprint on the sky, right? So we have to make those corrections. And when we do that, we get a bar graph that looks like this. This is very preliminary. It's based only on two years of data. It is sensitive only to planets that are within an 85-day orbital period. For reference, Mercury, our innermost planet in the solar system, has an orbital period of 89 days, just to give you perspective. All right? But this little snapshot in time is telling us that the prevalence of Earth-sized planets in our galaxy is about one in six. One in six stars has an Earth-sized planet, and mark my words, that number is going to increase as we probe further out. But this is a snapshot in time. Now, what does that say, though, about potentially habitable Earth-sized planets? Do we have any indication of what that might be? And we do. Barely. 
We just recently had our very first calculation of what that number might be, and it's based on these weak campfires. The weak campfires, where the habitable zone is cozied right up next to it, and the orbital periods of the planets are very short, within 85 days. So they give us the very first glimpse of how prevalent potentially habitable Earth-sized planets might be. And what we have learned, if you ask the question, okay, given Kepler data, how close is the nearest potentially habitable Earth-sized planet likely to be? Well, imagine a galaxy like the Milky Way. Imagine if the galaxy were scaled to the size of the continental United States, okay? And we were standing at one edge of, let's say, Central Park in New York City. The nearest potentially habitable Earth-sized planet is likely to be just on the other side of the park. Okay? And that's only based on this very preliminary data of the weak campfires. If we add to it, as we analyze the next two years of data and we, we learn about the, the stars that are more like our own, our own sun, that number is going to increase. Right? All right, so what's next? Once Kepler comes up with this number, we're going to design an experiment to not look just at that one handprint on the sky, but to look everywhere around us at all the closest stars, out maybe 100 light years or, or 50 light years, and do a complete census to find all of the planetary systems that are closest to us. Once we do that, we can do two things. One, we can build an instrument to probe the atmospheres of these planets. Here is a picture of Venus transiting our own sun, as seen from Earth. Actually, it was as seen from a, a satellite. And if you look really closely, hugging the surface of Venus is a tiny yellow band. That's Venus's atmosphere. It's just like maybe five kilometers high, its scale height. But what you're noticing is that the sunlight is filtering through that little yellow band. And as it does so, the atmosphere of Venus is going to leave its imprint on the light. So if we can capture and isolate that light, those photons that are streaming through the atmosphere, we have a hope of be able, being able to detect the composition of that atmosphere, finding out if there's oxygen in that atmosphere, um, finding out if there are biosignatures, if it's an atmosphere like Earth. Also, one day we hope to do something like this uh, for another planetary system. And the something like this is not the image of Saturn. Saturn here in this exposure is actually blocking the sun, so you've got a lot of sunlight filtering through Saturn's atmosphere and its rings, but that's not what I'm showing here. If you look very, very carefully in the upper left-hand corner of the rings of Saturn, we're waving. That's us. It's not only us, that tiny, tiny yellow dot, it's not only us, it's every human being in existence right now. It's not only every human being in existence right now, it's, it's every single human being that ever existed lived right there on that tiny little dot. So we hope one day to be able to take a picture of a pale blue dot like our own Earth. And we hope one day not only to take a picture of a pale blue dot, but to take a picture of a pale blue marble, to see continents, to see evidence of forestation, to see evidence of a shoreline. Uh, and that is within the realm of the possible. We know how to do that. We are not limited by imagination. We are not limited by ingenuity. We are limited only by resources, really. And with metered steps, we get there. Um, with that, I will 
end with a quote, and I will make a couple of comments if I can have another couple minutes. People often ask me, why, why are you searching for exoplanets? You know, well, why is this good? You know, we've got so many problems here on our own planet, for goodness sakes, right? Um, and I suppose I should answer them by saying, oh, but it's good for the economy, you know, we make jobs and we've got all this technology that gets developed and, and it improves the quality of our life and all of that kind of stuff. But I, I can't bring myself to give that answer because that's not what gets me up in the morning. Why do I personally uh, work so hard on this quest to find life in the galaxy? Um, I search for exoplanets because exploration and discovery uh, changes my perspective, gives meaning to my life, and gives me greater compassion. When human beings went to the moon and turned around and took a picture of our blue marble and realized that from space there are no borders, compassion increased on planet Earth because we realized our connections. When astronomers realized that the very materials that create the cells in our body are manufactured in the cores of stars, compassion grew, because we all realized how connected we are. And that, for me, is the point of exploration. I think sometimes about how life changed here on Earth when it went from water to land. And I wonder how life might change when we go from land to space. What potential might be unlocked? Where are we headed? Whether or not this quote turns out to be true, that one day from the shores of a new world we will gaze out at the sea that took us there and its waves will be stars, whether or not that turns out to be true, one thing I know for certain is we will be different for having tried. And that's what gets me up in the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It, it, it's a wonderful explanation for a subject that many of us are just mind boggled. Uh, you know the drill. Those of you who have to get children and other things, please be quiet because this is the favorite moment for many people in the audience. Those of you who have questions, please get them to your ushers right away and they will bring them to Emily and they will and she will bring them to me. And I will start by asking you, as you were approaching the realization that you were about to discover, you and your team were about to discover Kepler-10b, what was happening, how did that feel, and how did you know that you were almost there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Kepler-10b was an amazing thing because we saw the signature, these dimmings of light, in the first 10 days of data. It just st stood out like a sore thumb. And at that moment, we realized, oh my God, this thing is going to work, and it's going to exceed our expectations. And we started doing follow-up observations of it immediately with our biggest telescopes, Keck. We just put all of our resources into it, started observing it. And every single thing we learned about Kepler-10b, it, like, it was like adding another puzzle piece. And, and that feeling that you get when the puzzle piece fits, you know, that satisfaction, that deep satisfaction. But it, amazingly, you know, the time went by and we confirmed it and we knew a lot about it and I was writing the paper, but it really didn't come home to me in a profound way until I saw the artist's rendering of it. When I saw what the artist did to make Kepler-10b come alive, I said to myself, oh, wow, this is my planet Vulcan. And, and maybe you're thinking Star Trek or Spock or something, I don't know. But for me, when I came to NASA Ames, 
Early on in my career, we were building a ground-based observatory to find giant planets, you know, transiting their stars. Um, it was kind of like, it's how we cut our teeth. It's how we learned to do it, right? And it was hard, and it just it took so much work. And over the years, years and years went by, we found nada, nothing. And it was really disappointing. Of course, we learned a lot. Um, but, but the name of that robotic observatory was Vulcan. And it was named after the Roman god of fire and the hypothetical planet that they thought might explain the anomalies in Mercury's orbit, some hypothetical planet that might be orbiting interior to Mercury. And the reason for that is because we were sensitive to short period orbital uh, planets. So that, that's when it all kind of came home to me, and I, and I really realized what we had done and the implications. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So what's next? Uh, the question is, if we discover that there are um, habitable planets and perhaps people or creatures mm -hmm. on those habitable planets, should we be excited or should we be afraid? Mm. Uh, maybe they should be afraid. <laughs> Sorry. Um, here's what I've observed. The fact that we are approaching this rapidly, the fact that we see that this could actually happen, is creating a dialogue about are we ready and how are we going to treat it? What, what are our ethical responsibilities? It's just, it's raising a series of questions that we should all begin to contemplate. My hope and what I've observed is that we are going to rise to the occasion. That, that's my impression in talking to lots and lots of people. As they contemplate this inevitability, they begin to think, okay, we better clean our house because there's going to be company, <laughs> right? <laughs> a couple of questions that are, are coming from, I think, someone, people who probably had the same science class as I did. Um, are weak campfires dying stars? Ah, good question. Mm -hmm. No, not necessarily. They're actually less massive stars. So stars shine because they are fusing hydrogen into helium deep in their cores and releasing a tremendous amount of energy. And how much energy they release depends on how compressed their core is. And if the stars are very massive, their cores are very compressed and they burn furiously, releasing a lot of energy. But a star that has less mass is going to burn more gently and therefore release less energy. So these are lower mass stars. And um, is it possible that the stars and planets we're finding now, they're already gone because of the number of light years away from us that, that they are? The stars that Kepler is observing are out to about 3,000 light years. So it took light 3,000 years to travel here. In fact, I, I have to pause and give an interesting story. Kepler 10b, Kepler 10, the star, remember this is our first rocky planet, that star is about 540 light years away. And so the night before the press conference, I was preparing to meet the media the next day and announce to the world this discovery, and I was contemplating all of this, and I just subtracted 540 from the current year. And I Googled that year. And the link that came up in Wikipedia was the age of discovery, the dawning of the age of discovery. <laughs> so the point is, that when the light from Kepler-10 started its journey across the cosmic ocean to reach our telescope, European explorers were crossing the Atlantic for the first time. Yeah. So, s stars live for billions of years, not thousands of years. So, those planets do still exist, and I imagine some of them are going to become nice destinations. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that the telescope had stopped. Yes. Uh, stop sending data. So what happens with it now? That's a good question. We don't know yet. Um, so the telescope uh, has these reaction wheels. They're like gyroscopes. They spin and they keep the telescope really precisely pointed at the field. And that's actually what gives us our great precision. Uh, one of them failed. We had four. We need three. 
We had four for redundancy, and one of them failed last, I think it was July. A second one failed, like I said, on my birthday. <laughs> um, so now we're down to two. So it doesn't mean that we can't do anything. We have still this beautiful piece of technology out in space that we can communicate with and is capable of taking data. It just means that we won't be able to achieve the pointing stability necessary to take or to make planet discoveries, is really what we're saying. So NASA is currently thinking, one, about how we might recover one of the wheels, um, and two, what to do if we're left with two wheels. And that's a work in progress and will play out over the next months. Questions about finances. Yeah. Um, is money better spent on Kepler than uh, uh, Mar uh, manned Mars missions? Um, that's probably a question that you and manned Mars missions might disagree on. Uh, I, I doubt it. Um, I think we need a balanced approach. Uh, we, need, we can't put all our eggs in one basket because you never know what a discovery is going to lead to, right? Does, making scientific discovery is all about the unexpected. So by going to Mars, we're going to learn something that informs us maybe about the planets that we find, informs us about how life might look like, right? Are we going to recognize life when we see it? So we need a balanced approach, and NASA does that extremely well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think um, it, it, that there is a compatibility or incompatibility between the belief that there's an intelligent designer creating these universes and scientific, pure scientific thinking. Do I believe that there's a conflict? So, so are you saying that if we find life out there, might that clash with some people's philosophical beliefs? Or, or, or might it com be compatible or with? Or might it be compatible? That's the way I read this question. I mean, that, that is such an individual... Uh, I can, there's no one-size-fits-all answer. For me, of course not. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. That's what, that, that's what this is all about, right? I mean, we're, we're discovering, we're exploring, we're learning. We have to be responsive to what we find, right? And it does not diminish the wonder of the universe. <laughs> Quite to the contrary, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Why can't large planets be habitable? Oh, excellent question. So I keep saying we're finding the Goldilocks zone, but also Earth-sized. Why is that important? Well, you know, we look around in our own solar system and we see that if a planet is too small, like Mercury, the gravitational force on the surface is not large enough to hold onto an atmosphere. The atmosphere just kind of dissipates, it boils away. Um, a planet too large, like Neptune, Uranus, Jupiter, and Saturn, don't have a solid surface. They have a gaseous envelope made of hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium is not the stuff that our body's made out of, right? Organic chemistry, carbon-based chemistry, is about complexity, building up complex chains of molecules. So you don't expect to find sufficient quantities of those molecules in a gaseous envelope. So, you know, it, everything I've said could be very myopic, right? could be very narrow-minded, but you got to start someplace. We start with what we know. How do you deduce temperature? Uh, okay, so temperature, like I said, we measure the orbital period. Johannes Kepler told us there's a relation between the orbital period and the separation, the distance between the planet and the star. The orbital period squared, come on, you did this for Brian Greene yesterday. The orbital period squared is equal to the distance cubed, yes, thank you. So once you know the distance, if you know how much energy is being emitted from the central star, and you're at a certain distance, you can figure out how much energy you receive. And that is, can be translated into a temperature. We have a person here who agrees with your sense of, of compassion, but also asks the question about Finances. Can we put a price on compassion in order to extend our own financial leadership of the space exploration? I mean, we, we operate under certain realities, right? We can plan a metered approach and do what we can given the reality of, of our situation. But with that said, NASA's budget, for example, NASA is a major leader in the search for life in the universe. The leader, 
okay, all over the world. And funding for NASA is abysmal. It's, it's a tiny fraction of what it was during the Apollo era. So I think that we could do better. I hope that we do better. I think that uh, we have a long ways to go. Um, but that's about as far as I will take my political <laughs> leanings in this forum. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Dr. Natalie Battaglia. Thank you.